welcome dear learners today the topic we would be discussing is rhetoric and prosody let's see the presentation the term rhetoric means the art of speaking or writing effectively and thus we could also say that rhetoric includes the principles and rules of composition prosody means the patterns of rhythm and sound used in poetry the word rhetoric is derived from the greek word rhetoric meaning the art of oratory the origin of rhetoric dates back to ancient greece especially to aristotle who wrote his treatise the rhetoric in 320 bc he elaborates his views on the art of writing in it the object of writing is to communicate the writer's meaning in a clear and intelligible manner and thus he elaborates his comments on composition in prose and style in general rhetoric consists of three components invention which means relevant material disposition which implies arrangement of relevant material and style including choice of words verbal patterns sentence structure and rhythms prosody as we already told it includes the patterns of rhythm and sound used in poetry it is derived from the latin word prosodia which means song sung to music tone of a syllable it also includes the patterns of stress and intonation in a language and the study of versification especially of a metrical structure the main purpose of prosody is to consider the laws or principle that govern the structure of verse or lines of poetry let us see the figures of speech which are a part of rhetoric simile in a simile a comparison between two distinctly different things is indicated by the words like or as thus similarity in dissimilar things are brought together metaphor in a metaphor a word or phrase used in an imaginative way to describe something in order to make the description powerful we use metaphors where the difference between simile and metaphor is in simile we use the words like or as but in metaphor it is a, it would be a direct comparison metonymy in greek the word is used for change of name in metonymy we refer one thing by the name of another thing else that is closely connected with it personification in personification either an inanimate object or an abstract concept is spoken of as human attributes or feelings synecdoche in greek the word synecdoche stands for taking together and thus here a part of something is used to signify the whole or the whole is used to signify a part apostrophe an apostrophe is a direct address either to an absent person or um, to an abstract or inanimate entity rhetorical question a rhetorical question is a question asked not to evoke an actual reply but to achieve an emphasis uh, which is stronger than a direct statement zugma the use of single words standing in the same grammatical relation to uh, two other terms but with some alteration of meaning is called uh, zugma oxymoron it is a phrase that combines two words that seem to be the opposite of each other paradox is a statement that contains two opposite ideas uh, which um, seem to be impossible hyperbole in greek this particular word means overshooting it is it would be a bold overstatement and which makes the language something sound better more exciting understatement in greek there is a term called meiosis which means lessening so this figure of speech it represents something as much um, less in importance and sometimes it can be um, ironic also lightotis 
In Greek, it is used for plain or simple. It is a special form of understatement. Uh, normally, we make um, affirmative expressions, but by, re by refusing, it's opposite. Allusion, it, it could be a, a brief reference or explicit or indirect. Uh, it can be about a person or a place or event or any other literary work. Antithesis is contrast or opposition in meaning emphasized by parallel in a grammatical structure. Apart from this, there are many other terms which could be used in rhetoric like alliteration, consonance, assonance, onomatopoeia, pathetic fallacy. But these are the few uh, key terms of rhetoric where the poetry is more emphasized and the poets become successful. Moving to prosody, we would be looking into the important components of a prosody. First comes the meter. Meter is a rhythm of poetry determined by the arrangement of um, stressed and unstressed or long and short syllables in each line of the poem. Iambic pentameter is a most common meter in English poetry where the unstressed syllable is followed by a stressed syllable. Stanza is a common thing. In Italian, this word means stopping place. So stanza is a group of lines in a repeated pattern that forms a unit in few types of poem. Couplet, it's a pair of rhymed lines, octosyllabic couplet as line of eight syllables. Spenserian stanza. The Spenserian stanza of nine lines was introduced by Edmund Spencer. The rhyming scheme of this stanza is A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C, D, E, E. Spencer has used it in Fairy Queen and even um, Tennyson has used in Lotus Eaters. Heroic couplet. Lines of iambic pentameter which rhymes in pairs forms heroic couplet. And uh, this is introduced by uh, Geoffrey Chaucer in uh, The Legend of Good Women and the Canterbury Tales. Sonnets, we all know, it is a poem of 14 iambic pentameter lines. And uh, normally we have two important types. One is Petrarchan sonnet. Sir Thomas Viot uh, is the first person who introduced uh, the Petrarchan uh, sonnet in English. That Thomas Wyatt was the first person who introduced Petrarchan sonnet in English. The Petrarchan sonnet is normally divided into two parts, octave and sestet, where octave you have uh, A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, and sestet you have C, D, E, C, D, E, or C, D, C, C, D, C. This form is used by Milton, Wordsworth, D.G. Rossetti, and other sonneteers. Shakespearean sonnet, the Earl of Surrey, and other um, English experiments in the 16th century, they developed the form called English sonnet or Shakespearean sonnet. And this stanza, we have three quatrains and a concluding cu couplet. Uh, we have A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, and G, G. Next, we move to blank verse, and it was introduced by Surrey in his translation from the Aenid. And uh, this has become the standard meter for Elizabethan and modern poets. And Milton has used blank verse in his epic poems and James Thompson in the seasons. And so many other writers, uh, they have uh, employed blank verse in their works. Words were Tintin Abbey, Tennyson's Tears, Idle Tears, a few examples. Free verse is printed in short lines instead of with the continuity of prose. And it has more... Um, a controlled rhythm than ordinary ordinary prose, but it lacks the regular stress pattern. It has been employed by William Blake, Matthew Arnold, and the American poet Walt Whitman's You Could Find in Leaves of Grass, and T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday, Ezra Pound, and William Carlos Williams. Apart from this, we also have the other significant components of prosody like rhythm, and we have deductive logic, we have syntax, morphology, we have empathy, and they also concentrate on types of meter where we have unimeter, dimeter, trimeter, goes to uh, heptameter. And uh, the function of meter, uh, poetry itself is a metrical composition. So the function of meter includes arrangement of stresses, and that, that, that would be a sense of finality and completeness uh, giving a beautiful form to literature when rhythm and meter are properly employed by the writers. 
and we have different types of stanza. Uh, we have uh, the figures of speech like alliteration, personification, epigram, transferred epithet, anticlimax, circumlocution, and few types of poetry like allegorical and green poetry, satire, eclogue, ballads, and lyric poetry, ode, and all these, uh, it comes under uh, prosody. So I hope that this presentation has helped you to understand the basic elements of rhetoric and prosody. Thank you.